So we see these doom and gloom stories about dementia being the, the next major disaster to hit our societies in all Western countries. I just want to spend a little brief time querying do we have an impending disaster that we need to be aware of. So let's have a look at the incidents. I'm going to use statistics from Australia. The similar statistic rates work in the UK and certainly in North America as well. Um, currently in Australia at 2013, we, dementia and Alzheimer's disease has jumped as a leading cause of death to second place. It moved up from fifth place in 2004 to second place by 2013. You have to dig deeper because the whole number change, literally between dementia and CVD, is about 400 people. It's a small change. And it's these small changes that we're seeing are creating this increased death rate from dementia. The two key changes that have occurred in the Australian population is a decreased rate of death from ischemic heart disease and a slightly decreasing rate of death from CVD. And the end message is, you all die. If I treat something better, something else is going to get you. And in this case, what we're doing is getting better treatment, better prevention for heart disease, and so we're increasing our odds for getting dementia as a consequence. The other mechanism of action is the baby boomers. And there's some of them here. I'm glad to say I'm not actually one of them. I'm just short. But these are population statistics from the Sunshine Coast, which is where I'm now located, and Queensland. In the grey bars whoops, underneath are the Brisbane metropolitan area, which is a major regional city for Queensland, and the red bars indicate the Sunshine Coast region. And these are the number of people by age group. The Sunshine Coast region of Queensland, which is 100 kilometres north of Brisbane, and lots of beaches, sunshine all year round, lovely climate, has a problem. We have a massive proportion of people in the 40 plus age group and an exodus of people in the 20 to 30s and that reflects employment trends. The other factor that it reflects when we look at our growth rates is that people retire to the Sunshine Coast from all over Australia. So they quit work and this age group is arriving en masse to take up residence. So the Sunshine Coast region of Queensland is particularly sensitive to the possibility of an increasing prevalence of dementia and how we're actually going to ta target that. But this is a problem common to a lot of places across the world. And they're the baby boomers. The responsible people. Or irresponsible people because they live too long. So what's the cause? Well the cause of the dementia crisis that we're seeing is twofold. We're getting really good because we've spent so much money over the past 30 years on preventative treatments for other leading causes of death. Cancers, heart disease. We have a baby boomer generation coming through post-war. That means we have more people over 60 who didn't die from cancer and heart disease. And as a result, we are going to have more people with dementia. But this is not a health epidemic. This is a capacity crisis. And it's a crisis of our capacity in our healthcare systems to deal with dementia as it comes around. The incidence of dementia and the pre prevalence of dementia remains roughly the same. It's just there's a lot more people with it. So how do we prevent dementia? And that's, that's the target now, is we need to start thinking about ways of preventing the onset of dementia or slowing its onset. And there are multiple forms of dementia associated with ageing. The key message is these are all terminal conditions and there's no treatment. That's, nothing's changed on that. That's the fundamental message I can give you. Alzheimer's is the most common. There's a lot of debate over what Alzheimer's is. Roughly about 50% of all cases of dementia have Alzheimer's form, with an average life expectancy of 10 years from diagnosis, ranging from 2 to 20 years, so hugely variable in terms of, of outcome. Cause is unknown. It's likely that it's a multifactorial disease, and I suspect highly heterogeneous, which is why we can't find a cure. There are probably multiple variants of Alzheimer's, and this is a theme we've heard this session. ADHD has multiple variants, depression has multiple variants, but we all call them the same thing. Our diagnostic techniques haven't got there yet. And as I've indicated, there's no treatment. I, every, every year I hear the next wonder drug. <coughs> and every year I get disappointed because last year's wonder drug disappeared. And that's the, that's the cycle that's been happening. There's no treatment. The single largest risk factor is unpreventable. Don't get old. 
So we can't do anything that we can target specifically at this stage with Alzheimer's. Once it becomes a clinical symptom, our best chance is to target before the dementia appears. Identify those at risk and intervene while we can. And that leads us to pre-dementia disorders. There are a range of descriptions for the early stage dementia or pre-dementia stages and they've come in and out of fads over time. The current flavour of the month is mild cognitive impairment that was defined by Peterson from the Mayo Clinic in 1999 and has had over 19,000 publications associated with it in 10 years. Okay, any conference on dementia and MCI is everywhere. DSM-5 has added in a new category called mild neurocognitive disorder. Um, it's the same thing as MCI. It almost is verbatim the same diagnostic criteria. And the diagnostic criteria for MCI indicate that MCI exists in the space between what's considered normal ageing and dementia. And it's broadly considered to be perform a cognitive performance that's somewhere between one to one and a half standard deviations below an age mean, with dementia starting to appear at about two standard deviations. Now these are nosological categories. They actually have no symptom profile attached to them. That's the other thing I want to just keep reminding yourself. Think about symptoms. And the criteria for diagnosing MCI have changed over the past 15 years. The initial Peterson criteria argue that people with MCI have a subjective cognitive impairment, an objective cognitive impairment as a, which was specific to memory, uh, no impairment to cognition, ADLs or de and no dementia. And that essentially has been preserved over each iteration. The next two, the Winblad and the Albert criteria, these are consensus criteria coming out of the Alzheimer's Association. And they've modified slightly those criteria as research indicates other factors should be considered. I'm not going to get into this notion because I could talk about that for four hours, about how reliable is it to ask someone, is your memory okay? And how accurate a person, or how accurate is anyone, in saying my memory's okay or my memory's not okay, I'm having problems. There's a whole can of worms you open with that one. So we'll focus on the objective impairments instead. A test performance that is one to one and a half standard deviations below an age-based reference is the criteria for a subclinical impairment as defined by MCI. There are problems with this. It does not account for the pre-morbid or prior capacity of the person. Single test performances in this range are actually norm, normal, they're not abnormal. And the criteria for MCI only requires a single test performance. And Brooks illustrated this by looking at the normative sample for the Wechsler memory scale. This is a, a battery test of memory performances. What they found in those 550 healthy older adults, 64% had one test performance, more than one standard deviation below the mean. 25% had at least one test performance more than one and a half standard deviations. These adults do not have MCI. They are healthy, normal, older adults. So does that mean that MCI exists in 26 to 65 per cent of our population? Technically, that's what it would be. And that led us to our series of studies. We, we've conducted two longitudinal studies in Tasmania with, healthy older, with older adults with MCI and healthy controls over the past 10 years now. Um, the first study, we used the Windblade criteria, which were in existence at the time when we recruited this sample. Uh, impairment we defined as a performance below the 10th percentile, which was 1.28 standard deviations, which conveniently is halfway between 1 and 1 1.5. Uh, we looked for a, a single or more test performance impairment in, a model in any modality, and our participants were all 65 years of age with no prior medical history, no psychiatric, no neurological conditions. They were otherwise healthy. We ran them through a large battery of tests, of which the CAN tab featured fairly prominently. The reason we chose a large battery of tests is we weren't sure which test would be best, and we wanted to cover all the cognitive domains and, where possible, a visual and a verbal version of each modality. In terms of what happened to our participants, we tested them every 10 months for 20 months after baseline. We started with 40 adults with multi-domain amnestic MCI, 12 with amnestic single domain MCI, and 29 non-amnestic MCI and 25 controls. We ended up with different groups. 
and we looked at their results 20 months later, their classification was very different. And when we follow those trajectories, what we were finding was their baseline classification did not predict outcome. It didn't help knowing what their baseline was. And in fact, we were finding that a substantial number of every group, in this case five of our multi-domain amnestic MCIs recovered and had no impairment at subsequent assessment. Ten, all of our cases that developed Alzheimer's confirmed independently, all came from this group. When we look at our single domain amnestic MCI, they ended up everywhere, in all different directions, with no rhyme or reason or pattern. And likewise with our non-amnestic, high rates of recovery to normal levels of function. Our controls remained unchanged the whole way through. So we end up with a quite a messy picture when we're trying to say, okay, does, does the baseline diagnosis predict outcome? And our results are indicating, no, it didn't. So we go back to thinking, let's throw it all out and start again. And what we did is we conducted a discriminant function analysis. We took all the baseline test performances from every person. We took their outcome classification and we said, is there something in their baseline performances 20 months before that predicted their outcome classification? Is there some combination of test functions? We produced a significant discriminant function with two functions, which give us some decent, not perfect, but some decent separation between groups of control, which are in blue, our recovered people, the people who had a diagnosis of MCI got better in green, our MCIs who stayed in MCI, and the group of people who developed Alzheimer's. So we have some pattern indicating some separation. In terms of what loaded on the functions, what we find are a lot of CANTAB subtests. And first and foremost, the strongest loading test was RVPA, Rapid Visual Processing, the A' prime function, which is a ratio score. And that consistently shows up as the strongest loading, but also the PAL. These are good, solid tests that show up well. In terms of classifying our participants accurately, the discriminant function predicted group membership was accurate in about 83.8% of cases. It classified all of our Alzheimer's cases with 100% accuracy. It classified 88% <coughs> of our MCI cases correctly and 91% of our controls in recovered because they're the same. So it gives us improving, not perfect, but improving uh, functional prediction. We do have an issue with some false negatives. We have 8% of our MCIs were classified as controls. And we still have some false positives. These are people who were controls classified as MCI by the discriminant function, and 4% who were classified as Alzheimer's but had MCI. So we repeated the study. We got excited. But we said, you know, 120 odd adults in Tasmania, how representative are they? Let's do it again. So we recruited a brand new sample of older adults, ended up with 118 that had been followed through to 20 months reassessment. This time we varied the assessment protocol. We had a separate battery of screening tests to do the initial diagnosis and then follow-up tests were a slightly separate battery. This was to just deal with the possibility of confounds from the same battery being repeated. So we slightly modified it. We ran through the same protocol for classifying participants at every time point. Double blind procedure, classifying each participant at each time point and then we classified them over the three tide points as whether they had MCI, had developed MCI, or had recovered and were unimpaired. So this group had MCI to start with, but then no impairment afterwards, and this group stayed unimpaired. So we end up with two overall groups, MCI or no MCI. Again, we ran the discriminant function. Does the test protocol predict outcome of these two groups? We produced a single discriminant function that was significant, counting for 52% of the variance, and lo and behold, <coughs> top test, RVPA, again. And I'll come back to why I think that keeps coming up at the top every time. We have a range of other tests, including the PAL, spatial working memory, MTS and SSP, all CANTAB subtests that load up quite nicely into the test. <coughs> in terms of predictive accuracy, again, 83.9, almost identical to what we had in the first study. And more importantly for us, what we then did is we took the next step and compare our model of prediction with existing diagnostic criteria. So head against head, one for one, which one's best? These are the existing Windblad criteria. They give a true positive rate from our sample of 58%, a false positive diagnostic rate of 23%, and a false negative rate of 
13.5%. The discriminant function prediction gives a true positive rate of 83.9, a false positive of 5.9, massive reduction in false positive. And the false negative remains fairly high at 17.8. The outcome of this, to identify a genuine case of MCI as opposed to those who recover, certain things need to happen. We need to use multiple cognitive tests of function. We cannot just test memory and say we're looking for that. Secondly, we have to use repeat testing protocols. We're looking for a disease state that doesn't get better. It's meant to be a pre-dementia stage. At worst, it will stay the same or deteriorate. And that may help us reduce that false positive diagnosis. If you think that we were finding 25% false positive diagnosis is, is alarmingly large, it's been found in other longitudinal <coughs> studies. There are more studies coming up with longitudinal data reporting the same thing. If you use the existing MCI criteria, you find false positive rates of around 25%. Uh, Henry Brodie's team in Sydney did a community sample and found even a higher rate, 28% false positive. So these are alarming signs. If we are telling an older person, you have MCI and you'll get dementia, and 25% of the time we're wrong and they'll get better, what's the consequence of that? Yes. <laughs> I've sold the house, gone on the holiday, spent all the money, and then a year later he said, sorry, you don't have it, you're fine. This is not the same as a cancer diagnosis. This is not the same as HIV, where we accept a false positive because of the betterment of a false positive and getting it right later on. In this case, we have no treatment. A false positive creates ethical issues. There is no treatment to offer the person, and if they get better, we're wrong. So we need to try and get the false positive rate to zero and accept a higher false negative rate on the basis that repeat testing will correct that error. So it's not a diagnosis. This is a big thing to argue against um, a very strong North American Neurological Association that insists that MCI is a diagnosis. It's not. It fails to meet the basic essential requirements for a diagnosis. The criteria for MCI that are described in all the, in all the classification criteria are based on factors known to increase risk for dementia. These are not signs or symptoms. They do not constitute a syndrome of signs or symptoms. They are risk factors. If a person with MCI spontaneously gets better, then either the MCI is not a precursor to dementia or the criteria for diagnosing it are inaccurate. One or the other is true. The basic premise that's being used for classification of MCI is the same as diagnosing schizophrenia by risk factors. In this case, if we were to say the diagnostic, diagnostic criteria for schizophrenia would be that you have a family history of psychosis, you have used illicit drugs and or alcohol at some stage in your life, you're aged under 35 or over 65 when you first had symptoms, and you've had exposure to significant psychosocial stress. We wouldn't do that. That would be ludicrous, because we know automatically how incorrect that's going to be. But that's exactly what we do with MCI criteria. They are risk factors, not symptoms. So reconceptualise MCI as a risk factor, not a diagnosis. Change the terminology. Improve the sensitivity of our screening for MCI as a risk factor. We need to reduce that false positive error rate. And computerised testing may be very beneficial in this for two reasons. And the reason why I think the RVP test is particularly useful is because of its ceiling effect. You increase the ceiling effect. Most of the clinical neuropsychological tests that we use on the market are devised for clinically impaired populations, not subclinically impaired populations. So they don't have the discrimination sensitivity at the subclinical level. We need to have higher ceiling effects. Um, we need to have greater task difficulty and flexibility in that task that can be modified from individual to individual. So a task that automatically adjusts to the performance ability of the person and makes it harder. You can't do that with a paper and pencil test. But computerised testing allows to do that. And the capacity to do rapid performance assessment. No matter how fast I am with my reaction time, my stopwatch is not as quick as a computerised millisecond measurement. So that's important to do as well. And what we need from our computerised tests, for those who are developing the CANTAB into the future, we need more cognitive functions, not fewer. We need to expand the breadth of cognitive functions being assessed. We need norms. It's critical as clinicians that we have norms from high quality randomly stratified samples. 
in order to make clinical inference about impairment. We need a, a composite measure that gives us good diagnostic sensitivity. That's going to take a lot of work to get to that point. And lastly, just a cautionary note, the test is a tool. It doesn't replace clinical interpretation. It's a, a tool in the diagnostic process. And it's important that we recognise that a diagnosis takes a t the performance on the tool in conjunction with the observable behaviour of the patient plus their history to make an inference about what the cause of that change in performance is. Self-administered bedside assessments will fail where clinical interpretation is removed. There is an emerging trend to create computerised bedside assessments. Doctors are grabbing it because they don't need to employ a psychologist or a neuropsychologist to interpret. Hand it out, get the score and say, oh, you have dementia. When you take away the observation, when you take away the history and the clinical interpretation, you increase false positive diagnosis. So it's important that we try and get that message out to our clinicians. The test is a tool. It doesn't replace anything. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me.